out there. He's, uh, he's going to join us real soon. And then we have Dr. Hana P from EMIC and also Mr. Chu from Amin. Okay, one from aerospace and one from the shipbuilding, ship repair industry. So, yeah, we'll be starting really soon. Sounds good. And okay, then... uh, in one minute's time. Great. Good to meet everyone. <laughs> Okay, um, hello and a very good evening to everybody. I am Farah of Might and I will be your host for today. Welcome everybody to our Might Technomart Malaysia panel session on digital transformation in transport. So a little bit of um, introduction on Might. So basically Might is a government think tank that brings together the industry, the government, the academia as well as the society in terms of technology development, industry development for the nation, All right? And as well as, uh, meanwhile, for Technomite, the Might flagship program, which focuses on promoting uh, local technologies and technopreneurs as well as their capacities, their um, abilities uh, in this so, Technomart serves as a platform uh, to give visibility to our local um, technopreneurs um, to showcase their products and to share their abilities with the relevant stakeholders, especially in the area of post-industrial revolution. Along this line, today we shall deliberate on digital transformation of the transportation sector especially with the new normal that we are facing today and how it's impacting the industry. Before I move further, a little bit of housekeeping uh, announcement for you. So we'd like to seek all the participants to be on a silent mode to mute your microphones. And uh, of course, please feel free to drop your questions uh, at the Q&A slot uh, on the right side of the screen. And our moderator, as well as our panelists, will address them uh, during the Q&A session. And uh, if you face, you encounter audio problems or any technical problems in terms of WebEx, so please alert us, the secretariat, or maybe you can um, exit and re-enter using the link that you have. So, a little bit of uh, introduction to our moderator for today. So, with us, we have Dr. Gopinath. Rao Sinia, which is the CTO, the Chief Technical Officer and co-founder of Favoria Sendrian Bahad, a startup focusing on IoT platforms and solutions. He has architected many IoT solutions in current and previous organizations. He has many years of experiences in various IT industries with a focus given on research and development. He is currently the chairman of Internet of Things Working Group and the Malaysian Technical Standards Forum Berhad and the deputy chairman of CIRIM Technical Committee for Internet of Things. So he's very, very much qualified. Okay? The guy that uh, the perfect person to be our moderator for today. So with that, um, I would like to pass the baton to Dr. Gopi, to start our session for today. Over to you, Dr. Gopi. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, a very great evening to all the panelists and all the attendees for the session. Uh, well, just to recap again, today's title is Technomat Malaysia Panel Discussion on Digital Transformation in Transport. Now, talking about transportation or digital transformation for that matter. What is actually digital transformation? A lot of people nowadays have been talking about it. Uh, even government has introduced various schemes for industries, for organizations to transform their organizations, their businesses to adopt new technology. Now, digital transformation 
is actually the use of fast and frequently changing technologies uh, to solve their day-to-day -day problem. It could be their operational sites, it could be in terms of their processors, you know, their machineries, and so on and so forth. Now, digital technology now has become a new norm, more so with the COVID-19 that we are facing right now. Well, this is only possible if organizations transform their businesses with the latest digital technologies. Specifically in transportation and logistics, right? Um, it is estimated that the market is going to be hit about 145 billion by 2025. And this is due to, because of the advancement in hardware uh, and software, the hardware becoming cheaper, becoming better in terms of processing and so on. Now there are a few technologies that's involved that enables the adoption of digital, uh, such as internet of things, blockchain, AI, drones, and many more, right? And of course, when you talk about transportation, is also mobility comes into the picture. Uh, vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to building communication, you know, basically is a vehicle to X. Now, the first thing is that when an organization want to transform, they must understand the ecosystem that must be in place for the digitalization to take place. Well, what is the ecosystem? First, we need to understand what type what are the data that is required for them? What devices need to be installed to read the parameters? How are they going to collect this data to improve the efficiency? How to send this data efficiently? Which platform to use? Which analytics tools to use? What are the expectations? Now, finding answers for all these questions at the beginning will ease the transportation process, right? Now, the next question is, is it really required? Can I just do a normal business without transforming? Well, the ball is in your court. If one wants to be competitive, well, digitalization is a must, or you face becoming irrelevant, right? So now we can see so many businesses affected by this COVID-19, right? So we need to quickly transform. We need to quickly adopt the technology so that we can offer different kinds of services. Take, for example, aerospace industry, right? How are digital data being used in all stages across aerospace, starting from the design, analytics, manufacturing, quality assembly, delivery, in services, and so on. And in fact, recycling and reuse. When you talk about reuse, something that struck to my mind is that, you know, the SpaceX example, you know, their goal, SpaceX is basically the Elon Musk company, so the goal is to reducing space transportation costs. And how they did that? They use some kind of the vertical, you know, propuls propulsive landing. They reuse the first stage of the rocket so that they can use it again and again. Now, this is one way of reducing the cost. In fact, a lot of research is also required for us to adopt uh, these various kinds of uh, technologies. Now, before we move on with the panel discussion, um, let us hear from uh, Lux Research, uh, which Harshit Sharma is going to present on the digital transformation in transportation and logistics. Uh, let me just briefly introduce Harshit. Harshit leads Lux Research research services uh, for the digital transformation of heavy industries such as logistics, oil and gas, and marine sectors, and is based in Lux Research Singapore office. Harshit has a deep expertise in key emerging technologies such as digital twins, asset tracking, blockchain, and cold chain monitoring. Now, prior to joining Lux, Harshit designed and manufactured completion tool as an R&D engineer at Halliburton. Harshit received his MS from National University of Singapore in Mechanical Engineering with a focus of offshore technology catered for the subsea market in Malaysia. Now, I would like to welcome Harshit uh, to make the presentation. Harshit, is for you. Uh, Harshit, yeah. Let me quickly share my slide slides.
So can everybody see my slides? I take that as a yes. Yes, Sashit, we can proceed. Great, so thanks again, everybody, for joining in, and it's my pleasure to present on what are some of the broader trends right now we're observing in transportation and logistics, and essentially how digital can act as a tool uh, for us to really supplement and resolve issues in this industry at this point in time. Uh, so very briefly, before I go further, a quick introduction, even though we just mentioned what Lux is, we are a research and consulting firm. And we do consulting or research advisory on emerging technologies. So things such as electric vehicles, AI would be the perfect kind of topics where we do research on. So if you're interested to learn more about us, you can definitely find us on LinkedIn or Facebook, whatever be the case. So with that said, in this next uh, sort of 10 minutes or so, let me quickly just talk about what are the modern issues the industry today is facing? So when you look at logistics and transportation in general, what are the three main issues we are facing today? And of course, COVID comes in and plays a big factor here as well. And then let's briefly talk about what exactly digital transformation is. And in the interest of time, I will present one case study that just sort of shows how value can be created for logistics using digital. And just to wrap the conversation up, let us also talk about what happens because of COVID, because I know that's an issue in everyone's mind. So people are curious, how does it impact? So We'll, we'll try our best to answer sort of that question as well. So with that said, let's briefly talk about when it comes to logistics, how exactly the industry has behaved you know, in recent years. And uh, this figure on the right would be a perfect start to begin this. Uh, in fact, there are many industries in the world who are always going through ups and downs generally, but logistics or just the aspects of couriers, the aspect of shipping and everything is not really one of them. If you look at the revenues of companies such as FedEx, DHL, year on year, they have seen great growth. As a matter of fact, between 2008 to 2018, FedEx actually grew by 75%. That's just how good the industry has been in terms of just growth in general. And even companies like Coin and Agel or Maersk have also seen a, a good growth in the revenue. So if it's any industry who's concerned with revenue or cost in general, then logistics and transportation is slightly okay here as opposed to other kind of industries like oil and gas or power for that matter. And there are sort of three reasons why this industry has seen a good sort of rate of growth in recent years. And if you were to bucket these uh, trends overall, it's because of, of course, globalization and trade. Today, supply chains are highly decentralized. Uh, every single uh, country today is having goods shipped around. So the more and more trade has become just global across the world. Um, there has been a huge growth of digital consumers. So today people are buying everything online. E-commerce is now one of the main drivers for consumption for people. And lastly, of course, is the fuel prices. And this is a very interesting observation because ever since the 2014 uh, oil price disaster happened in the oil and gas industry, just the cost efficiency for logistics has gone up really, really high, especially for diesel or any petroleum prices in general. Now, while all these trends have actually helped the industry become much more bigger in size and revenue, whatever be the case, it has also created challenges for logistics. So for example, today we are highly globalized, we are highly decentralized, but it's also created an issue of visibility. So when we talk of visibility, it's the ability of tracking goods, monitoring their health, ensuring the stakeholdership or accountability of parts is really, really well you know, visible to everybody. But just because of the fact that we are so decentralized and globalized today, there's much higher supply chain risk. So if you see on this figure on the right, only 13% of executives of KPMG spoke with had actually full visibility of their parts and goods across their supply chain. So generally, people still don't know where exactly the part is or product is across when it comes to trade because of how globalized we are today. Uh, similarly, it's great to see that there's been a boom in digital consumers. Online purchasing has grown exponentially. In fact, by 2016 itself, it was roughly a 1.1 1. 1 trillion industry by that point itself. And by 2020, it's going to be much more bigger as well. So while this has been great for logistics, it's also created the issue of this customer expectations. Now, most of us today, uh, maybe five years back, if someone told us your part will take two years, two months, or two weeks to come, you'll still think about something like that. But today, people expect everything to come in one day, two days, or three days. So just the consumer expectation has gone all the way 
from weeks to just two or four days for things to arrive. And that's a big problem of agility when it comes to logistics today. And then lastly, while it's been great that fuel prices have been quite low, it's easy to run your trucks and everything on low prices in, in petroleum, but it's also created the massive issue of emissions and sustainability. So a very interesting observation here has been that ever since oil prices fell down, air cargo, which is the fastest way of sending goods around, has actually grown at 10% every year. And that's really, really crazy to observe because generally air cargo is the most expensive way of you know, trading. But because fuel has been so cheap, each year it has grown really, really well. And as a matter of fact, it was projected to grow by 4% every year. But you can see on the figure on the right just how immense air cargo is when it comes to emissions. It's roughly 400 times more emissions compared to an oil tanker or bulk carrier vessel, anything like that. So that's had a huge impact on the overall emissions of logistics today. And that's of course made many companies commit to find new ways on how they can become more greener, how can they ensure that they can reduce their emissions in general. So from all the mega trends that we saw in transportation and logistics, these are three trends that come out right now, which are the challenges. So issue of visibility, making sure we can track the location, health, accountability of all goods. Agility, ensuring that no matter what route you take, whether it's air, land, or sea, you make sure goods are reaching in a week's timeline, four days timeline, and do all of this while also reducing the emissions. So sustainability has also become a big problem. Now, while these challenges have been popping out, the other issue that we are also seeing coming through now is, of course, COVID. So if you see this figure here, which is from the World Trade Organization, so their projections are really, really dire. So if you look at the pessimistic scenario, we are looking at a 50% drop in this global trade merchandise in general. And even in an optimistic scenario, you're looking at at least 30% drop of trade across the world. So not only the industry suffers with visibility, agility, and sustainability, but now you also have this issue of just loss of business in general, which makes you wonder that how do you survive in this environment when you already have inherent challenges and on top of it, your business is also sort of stalling out. So this is where digital transformation really becomes interesting because at the end of the day, it is a tool for improving your business or your organization, would it be the case. Uh, some of the, kind of the industries we have seen, so you'd say the power industry, has actively used digital transformation for cost efficiency. Some of them used for increasing the revenue. So when it comes to logistics, it's going to be a similar sort of example as well. So this is how we define digital transformation as well. Uh, no matter what is the industry, at the end of the day, there are six things you're trying to achieve from digital transformation. So you're going to either uncover new insights, find some new information, invisible insights. You're trying to predict something in the future, something you might do in predictive maintenance. You're trying to optimize a certain parameter, maybe a refinery's production or something like that. You want to upskill your staff, you know, give them better software to make decisions. You're trying to make sure that information is really accessible across the board in the company, or you're trying to automate certain tasks. So whether it be the industry, whether it be the end outcome, these are the six things you're trying to achieve from digital transformation. And how generally you can achieve these six outcomes is by using a combination of new technologies, of course, and digital use cases. So for example, an autonomous vehicle is a digital use case. It can be applied to logistics, it can be applied to mobility, it can be applied to a port, whatever be the case. Uh, similarly, something like asset tracking, asset monitoring is agnostic, any industry can use it. So for the logistics industry, this figure here sort of gives you an idea of all the use cases that are currently being explored. So when you look at the planning side of logistics, uh, you're looking at forecasting, scenario optimization, digitization that is moving everything from paper-based to software are use cases that are actively being used. And in transit, uh, visibility, end-to-end uh, -end visibility using sensors, asset monitoring are all common use cases that are today being used. And of course, on the last sort of column here, you can see a bunch of technologies that are being used today. And this ranges from all the way from AI to augmented reality. So there's, there's lots of work that is happening in the industry right now, but it's definitely at an early stage. There's still a lot of development to happen. So you'll still see a lot of improvements coming in the next five or 10 years for that matter. But just for the discussion today, let's take a deep dive into one of these use cases and talk about how it creates value for a company in logistics. So autonomous operations, of course, is a really interesting use case of digital technologies. It's 
one of the most popular, uh, whether it's in any industry, even in oil and gas for that matter, people want to drill oil in the most autonomous way possible. So we define autonomous operations as any way of automating a complex decision-making process. So it's not just the labor, if you can also automate a decision-making process, that's also an, an autonomous operation. So in logistics, you can use, use autonomy in trucking, in your port operations, and in any sort of operation you do in an offshore marine environment are all good examples of how you can use autonomous operations. And some of the reasons why this industry wants to adopt it is of course the labor shortage, which is going to happen over the next 10 years. Safety has always been an issue, whether it's for a driver or just people on the road for that matter. And when you look at the shipping side of things of marine, it's also interesting because you can reduce the crew size. So you can make your operations just more leaner in terms of operational costs. So there are many companies who are trying to achieve autonomous operations and logistics. You have companies like Outrider who have created a completely autonomous sort of yard for warehouses or even for port operations. Watsila is working on autonomous tugboats and Tesla is someone who has built autonomous vehicles, of course, for trucking for that matter. So the landscape for autonomous operations has tons of players involved here. But one case study that's really interesting, which, which Lux would like to share today, is between UPS and QSimple. So QSimple is a company which is based in the US. It's a startup who is working on the software stack for autonomous vehicles. Now, UPS had identified two main issues in its sort of long distance haulage business. One was the carbon emissions, which we just spoke of earlier in sustainability. And the other was how do they increase the safety of their people? and make sure they can strategize around labor shortages. So UPS worked with TU Simple and they offered them an autonomous truck, essentially a truck which already had all the sensors, your LIDARs, uh, your sort of gyroscopes all installed into it. And TU Simple created a software stack. They basically took all the data from these sensors, created an environment, fused all the data together to help create an AI for decision making. So when I say that, essentially this is not a fully autonomous vehicle. All it is doing is that there's an AI that really captures all the information that's coming from these sensors. And using that, it creates certain incremental autonomy. It can help in a bit of the steering, acceleration or braking, and all these sort of tasks help the driver, not replace him at this point in time. So it improves the driver's safety, keeps them happy, improves your fuel efficiency as well, so it makes it much more cleaner as well. And this was a great success. Eventually, after the pilot, UPS actually bought a stake into you simple as well in 2019. And so why we find this case study interesting is because this shows that full autonomy is still some time away, at least 10 years away, 15 years away. What you can do right now is to incrementally add autonomy to your sort of like operations. So maybe just help the driver in decision making by a better software stack or anything like that. But regardless of that, you will be able to create value via digital technologies. So this is one case study, of course, of how you can do it. There are many such use cases and examples. If anybody on this phone is interested to learn about it, just drop blocks and note, and we are happy to sort of talk about it as well. So, okay, we have talked about the challenges. We have seen how digital transformation can help this industry. We have one case study, but let's also talk about one of the most popular things, which is how does COVID impact our industry? And in, in this case, it's about logistics and transportation. So again, internally at Lux, we have created several frameworks to really discuss and decide how does COVID impact every industry. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to sort of bring that up and talk about how we see it impacting logistics as well. And some of the trends we observed here is that because of COVID, autonomy and electrification will experience dynamic shocks. So when we say that, dynamic shock means that in the near term, something will change. So, you know, it'll probably fluctuate but within six months, a year or so down the line, things should return back to normal. So what we are seeing is that both autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles are going to suffer in the near term. And autonomy is going to get hindered because no trials are taking place, no development is happening. Um, how will you test these sort of vehicles? Because there's no traffic really flowing around, there's less data to collect. Social distancing is also an issue. So in near term, autonomous vehicles won't really make much progress. And similarly, EVs, uh, at the end of the day, in this kind of difficult environment where all auto companies are suffering, the end consumer has less money to sort of invest in. Of course, EVs will suffer. Combustion vehicles are still cheaper. So if somebody does plan to buy a vehicle right now, they might go for a combustion vehicle. 
but for parts of the world like the EU, where you have tons of regulations to make sure that you know EVs are still bought, there things would remain the same. And so very broadly, the aspects of autonomy, electrification, and logistics will suffer in the near term, slow down in development, but over the course of a year or two years, return back to normal as well. Now, the other thing we can see here is that this sort of analysis mirrors what we are seeing in the industry as well. So when it comes to autonomous vehicles, it's been a mixed bag of announcements this year. So GM's uh, self-driving startup called Cruise laid off 8% of its staff, which was an, an unfortunate uh, scenario. But we also saw companies like Amazon buying someone like Zeus, which is a self-driving car. So still some positive developments are also taking place. And again, unfortunately, Ford postponed its entire project on autonomous vehicles up until 2022. So it's been a mixed bag for autonomy, and that sort of reflects what we have analyzed as well. Similarly, uh, the topic of today, which is digital transformation, that's going to get a really good persistent shock. So when I say persistent, this is something that's going to stay on for the next five years, 10 years, whatever be the case. And the main reason for that is because under COVID-19, people are getting pressed to use digital technologies. And so when they do that, they're realizing the benefits of it. So if you're using a wearable to make sure your driver's health can be monitored, you're making sure people can be tracked into doing social distancing. Once you bring in these technologies, people know how valuable they are and they're not gonna go away. So anything in digital, wearables, augmented reality, industrial IoT, all should benefit because of COVID-19 in the near term. And again, this is something we have seen in the industry already. Companies like FedEx, who just partnered with Microsoft to create their own sort of digital transformation services to launch new products. And these partnerships are happening regardless of COVID. So the two of them have also launched a supply chain visibility product. It's called FedEx Around, and things are moving here regardless of COVID. And then lastly, one trend that is slightly adjacent to maybe digital in general, but is really interesting is the aspect of fuels. So, we talked about how oil prices really drove this industry in terms of its profitability, but by and large, most of the solutions out there, say biofuels or synthetic fuels, are going to suffer because of COVID as well. And these new emerging fuels like hydrogen that are coupled with renewable energy are going to see an uptick as well. But overall, um, the transition towards greener fuels, towards electrification, at least in the much longer term, will continue. So you will see things such as diesel and petrol going away, regardless of how bad COVID has hit the world. And this is, again, what we have seen as well, that regardless of the countries, the various diesel bans, or whatever be the case, are still going. So for example, the UK, who wanted to ban diesel and gasoline by 2040, actually is now planning 2035, because they feel COVID is actually a helpful time for implementing such kind of regulations. So with that said, I hope uh, the broader trends, it's also how COVID is going to impact our industry was helpful to you. Uh, I look forward to some questions now during the webinar as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Harshit, for your presentation. It's uh, uh, very enlightening to see, you know, different perspective of uh, you know, logistics issues, how COVID has, uh, in some cases, uh, could help in terms of uh, transforming the businesses and so on. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to the panel discussion. Um, so we have four panels, panelists uh, for today, uh, including Harshit, which I've introduced uh, earlier. Our second panelist is, uh, let me just bring it up. Yeah, Dr. Mohammad Hanafizeh. Uh, Yeah, Dr. Hanafi have spent his uh, aerospace professional career okay, in the field of manufacturing and R&D. Uh, he has spent four years as a mechanical engineer at CTRM Aero Composites before joining AMIC. AMC stands for Aerospace uh, Malaysia Innovation Center as a research analyst in 2013 involved in many aviation technology development. He also has passion in the field of learning and development. His PhD is from uh, University Putra, Malaysia, which he obtained uh, last year. Our third panelist is Mr. Nazari Khalid. 
Now, Mr. Nazrit Khalid is a well-known commentator and scholar in the field of humanity. Okay, he has been involved as a speaker, a moderator, a panelist for 200 seminars and conferences worldwide, and has published over 350 articles in print and online. He came to a prominence in this field of Maritime Institute of Malaysia, a policy think tank under Ministry of Transport Malaysia, where he served as senior fellow, research coordinator, head of center of Maritime Economic Industry. While at MIMA, he represented Malaysia at International Maritime Organization meeting and Asian Maritime Transport Working Group meeting, a very extensive uh, profile he has. Uh, he is a visiting scholar at the Bahariya University, Karachi, Cardiff Business School, University of Paris, National Institute of South China Sea Studies, and Sun Yat-sen University of Guangzhou. He is currently the head of group corporate communication at a company listed at the Bursa Malaysia, involved in the marine and deep industry. Today, he represented representing as an adjunct professor at the University of Malaysia, Ternanu. And he sits in advisory council of Yayasan Panaraju, Pandirikan Bumiputra, and so on and so forth. He holds an MBA from International Islamic University of Malaysia and BA in Business Administration. Our final, our fourth uh, panelist is Mr. Chiu Sun Kong. Uh, he is a deputy director of Srava Sleepless. Berhad, which is a member of Association of Marine Industries of Malaysia. Uh, Srawa Sleepway is a shipbuilding and a ship repair company based in Mary, uh, Srawa, since 1965. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Auckland, New Zealand, and master's degree in naval architecture from University of Michigan. Since joining Srawa Sleepway, Sun Kong, has been leading the change to increase efficiency and quality through the use of technology in the production and management system of the company. He currently serves as the deputy director of production. Now we have uh, basically from the research to aerospace and also relation to ships as well. So these are all transportation that we're going to talk today. To the uh, members of heart here today, if you have any questions, you can always uh, write it down, type it down in the chat, and we will answer the questions towards the end later. Now, we have heard uh, Harshit presented about the overview of the transportation, uh, digital transformation in the transport industries. Now, we are in a situation where it's difficult for some businesses to move forward. Why so? It's because, as you know, COVID-19 has affected many sectors, many industries are affected. Many have shut down, many are trying to transform, and so on. I will ask, like to ask um, Nazri first, right? How can digital transformation help industries to grow and become more resilient during these hard times. Uh, Nazri? Is Nazri here? I think he's on mute. Okay, maybe Harsha can start first. Yeah, yeah, certainly I think uh... Your, your question is around how digital uh, companies at this point in time. I feel it's all yeah. using them. Like I think it's all about making sure you add as much of automation, as much of remote connectivity you can put in. So using augmented reality or it's to train your staff before they actually come together. Uh, wearables. I mean, I can see every technology in digital. Uh, being really useful right now. It's a matter of people taking the step. And uh, what we have seen actually in other industries, I think in particular outside logistics, people are accepting a lot more. I think in this industry, it's been a, it's been a lot more slower. But uh, definitely, anything in digital right now is 
anything in automation will be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just my two cents. Yeah, thanks. Ajay. I think you you correctly pointed out. In fact, uh, I've read some research also stated that you know uh, the transportation industry is about a bit slow in uh, adopting this digital transformation um, compared with the other industries. Um, if uh, Nazri is here, you may want to provide your give your opinion. Okay. Hi guys, Dr. Rao. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, thank quickly uh, Mike and uh, the others for putting this show and also um, uh, Hashid, the previous presenter, for stealing about 90% of my points. So I'm going to wrap up what I'm going to say in reality, big data analytics, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, now people are even talking about quantum computing. I'm rattling all these things like I know what I'm talking about. No, I don't. <laughs> As I say, artificial intelligence is no match for natural stupidity. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that without uh, the, uh, the attendant uh, attention to uh, developing and nurturing skill human capital, all these uh, 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 solutions and also technologies and also systems uh, would not be put to optimal use. And uh, we have already gone beyond the point of raising awareness and uh, promoting acceptance of our R4.0. And you can see that uh, even we have MITI, Ministry of uh, International Trade and Industries, uh, has even rolled out a national master plan for uh, Industry 4.0. I'm not sure to what extent uh, this has been carried out because of the change of government. And also probably in all line of the impact of uh, COVID-19 also has had an adverse impact on its uh, uh, implementation. But I'd like to think that uh, a lot of our thoughts uh, had gone into it. Okay, I'm a bit biased because I was uh, invited to do, to, uh, to partake in one of the stakeholders meetings. So I feel a little bit, uh, you know, a sense of ownership about this uh, master plan. But I think we, let's go back to what the master plan says about uh, developing uh, skill human capital and also the kind of a timeline uh, which is uh, being visualized to take Malaysia to the digital uh, 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 era. And not only that, but also to, to be competitive at it. Um, but this also has to come along with you know, uh, favorable policies, uh, investment and spending on ICT infrastructures, uh, digital connectivity is very, very important, and also uh, broadband high-speed internet is, is key to this. Also collaboration and so-called co-operation uh, across academia, the industry, policy makers, and so on, and also the focus on uh, digitization and immersion. Yeah, I'm thinking to, uh, to catch myself uh, uh, to think about what I just said. Maybe I hope I made sense, but at the same time to to uh, to go back to what the the, the core uh, of the discussion uh, of uh, digital transformation in transport. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, application of uh, enabling technologies of IR 4.0. Uh, in in uh, in the uh, uh, in shipping, for example, now there's a use of real-time information by shipping companies to send sea data on cargo transported by vessels, and uh, there's uh, you know a prototype of a virtual uh, crewless ships uh, with e-navigation, uh, electronic charge, uh, technologically driven, eco-friendly, uh, uh, fuel-efficient features. Uh, computer aided software CAD, which is used in a uh, shipbuilding, ship repair, uh, predictive analysis used in uh, maintenance, uh, use of IT management information system by port operators to plan container loading and offloading and to track container at yard. So we are, we are seeing the application of, uh, of uh, uh, IR slowly but surely in, in the uh, uh, transport sector, which of course relates to uh, the big uh, uh, logistics sector. So. Uh, I'd like to think that the uh, maritime industry, although uh, has a bit of a reputation for being rather sluggish when it comes to adopting latest technologies, uh, in the last five or ten years, we have seen uh, an increasing uh, an uptick in the immersion of uh, players of all things uh, uh, IT and Industry 4.0 application. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Nazri and Ashit for the great insight. Uh, I think the first, uh, I mean, what we acquired here is that you know, industries need to adopt, right? Industries need to adopt to latest technology for them to progress well 
uh, to be competitive and be part of the change that is required uh, to stay alive, I would say, right? Now, you see, it's not easy to for, for some industries uh, to make these changes. Uh, it's always not easy. Now, some industries may want to look into diversifying, right? Some industry may want to focus on what they are doing, but then the challenge of how to digitize the entire operation will be difficult for them. Now, the next question is that should an industry right, uh, diversify their business to overcome the market challenges that we are facing right now? Uh, maybe I will let me give this to Mr. Sunko, maybe? Um, I think um, in our business as a leader, um, maybe uh, the problem of diversification of our business is, uh, is already there. Uh, the problem is uh, with adopting technology to meet our needs. Um, should I should I share uh, my slides uh, right now? Because it will focus on maybe the challenges we face at the same time uh, with this problem um, yeah, of sure, sure. adopting the technology. So let me let me share my slides. Yeah, I need I need uh, Farah. I yeah. need allow me to share my slides. Okay. Um, I'm part of a company. is part of a, a ship. Uh, I mean, uh, Malaysia. We are a yard, uh, East Malaysia, and we are a small yard. Uh, but since 1995, 1965, we'll be building a more sophisticated vessel like this, a steel vessel for Australia. And then in the 80s, we start building vessels like this. Uh, this is aluminium crew boat for, for the oil and gas industry in Malaysia. Um, so apart from this, we also built um, vessels like this. This is a container carrier for Papua New Guinea. And this is a research hydrographic survey vessel for Brunei, Brunei Shell. And at the same time, we have a fishing vessel. So when you talk about uh, specifying the diversity diversity of products, uh, we certainly do not lack. But this range of products becomes a problem. Um, I mean, these are the other products that we have um, over the years. So one of the challenges we have is, as an industry, we struggle both as an industry because it is very competitive. Um, and of course, like what Mr. Nazri said, uh, our adoption of technology has been maybe the slowest among other industry uh, in Malaysia. So one of the problems we have is we have so many products that have relatively short lead time. So all the vessels you see just now, they have to be completed at least uh, at, at maximum 14 months. Um, so we don't normally finish our design. We don't normally finish our design by the time we start building these products. So we adopt something called concurrent engineering, which means that we start producing parts work in progress parts before the design is even completed or even approved. Uh, some of the designs are approved maybe six months after we started the project. And yep, so this is the issue we have. So in that sense, many of the technologies at their current stage are not suitable for us. Um, or it is too cost prohibitive for us to, to venture into. ER, AR, 3D printing, robotic welding, uh, at least from, um, from us in Sarawak, uh, building vessels from Malaysia or Australia um, is just not feasible at this present time. But having said that, um, there are some simple things that we have adopted and used successfully. Uh, first of all, like design. Uh, I think uh, Enche Nazri already mentioned that in design, uh, it helps tremendously when we, when we digitalize our product, uh, visualize it in 3D, do verification and even prove to owner that it works in some kind of simulation, uh, it does help. Apart from, that, um, in, well, apart from that, in our management system, uh, we have adopted uh, internet technologies since long time ago. 
which helps uh, tremen tremendously. In our repair system as well, we track progress of, uh, of our repair uh, and automatic generation of reports, uh, even quality control reports, which we can view uh, from two different yards, uh, they have helped tremendously. And also for our customer side, from our customer side, sorry for that. Um, we have been able to provide uh, information to our customer, customer that is uh, overseas. Uh, most of them right now is in Australia. So they can see our reports, they can view the current progress uh, because our system is uh, linked to our internal management system, but our web portal is linked to our, info, our, our management system. And something interesting recently, this is a vessel we delivered two weeks ago to Bintulu port. Um, while we're commissioning this, and this uh, water jet system, uh, it is the first to be done in Malaysia. This uh, control is the first to be done in Malaysia. And at this time, Singaporeans are not allowed to come into Malaysia. So what happened was this vessel's control system was programmed uh, remotely. Uh, the service engineer was here to connect it up. And the, then the, 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 what is that, the expert in Singapore programmed uh, the control system through, through uh, a remote, remote uh, I think they used either team viewer, I think they used team viewer to program, <laughs> to program this, uh, the water jet control system. So that's all from us. Uh, sorry, sorry. I think, uh, I think the okay. yeah. technologies are useful. Uh, but the thing is, uh, a lot of the product available out there is too expensive or not relevant for us. So for us, we have been developing all these things you see, most of them has been developed by ourselves. Um, so is it worth it? I think it's definitely yes. And certainly we have to do it because this is the future. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sun Kong. I've heard about autonomous cars, autonomous trucks. I think we are moving into autonomous ships as well. Right, uh, Mr. Sun? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't want to be the first. We're <laughs> <laughs> actually developing uh, some kind of a prototype for an autonomous uh, ship. So, uh, but of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, issues to be sorted out with the insurance and the legal aspect of it, safety, security, and so on. So, um, okay. Okay. So with what's yeah. happening in the uh, mm. Japanese tanker in Mauritius, I think it, it highlights the anxiety of a lot of people that even in the hands of experience, group when you can see that kind of uh, disaster happening so what more with a uh, coolers uh, yeah, autonomous true. ships right so that will take yeah, some true. time like, before you can, can uh, yeah no the diversifying their business uh, if you are within the same business it is fine like what you know uh, mr soon mentioned earlier right so different types of ships and so on but in some cases they need to diversify the entire business which this is totally uh, against you know totally new for some of the industries they need to rescale they need to learn new things well is it really required or which they should focus on so what is your opinion on this uh Hashid? right so you, when you say opinion this is around autonomy in general like uh yeah yep yeah. I, I think for what we have seen so far is that Autonomy is a lot more uh, valuable if it happens in increments or just in in phases. Mm -hmm. so I think generally in for autonomous vehicles, you have different levels what autonomy looks like. But I think full automation, which where no driver is is present, for that to be mass scale or commercial, I think at least in our view, it's like way further down the road, and it's it's ROI is not actually that clear. But uh, mm -hmm. any sort of automation in decision making. So, for example, if you have a driver and you help him automate some of the decisions he has to take while driving, for example, any of these kind of smaller elements, that's where a really strong ROI exists. And that's also what we saw in, say, the offshore oil and gas industry, where they still drill with people there, but what they do is for the driller are automated by an AI. So I think that's what we see. Incremental is more valuable than fully autonomous uh, sort of system, <laughs> even in shipping or anywhere. Okay, great. great. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gopi, can I add something? Yes. Yeah, uh, please. So since we are uh, in this topic, so I think yeah. uh, um, everyone is also interested in the topic of autom automation in the aerospace industry. 
But mm-hmm. uh, this is something that I think we need to um, have a very um, careful and a very um, thorough um, study because we already uh, saw two incidents, unfortunate incidents uh, that happens. Uh, that is part of actually the process to automate, to automate the, the, the pilot process and up to a stage where they cannot um, um, take over the control because of this um, uh, defect in the automation. So I think um, the effort has been um, taken, uh, but we still have to uh, look um, further through the safety, through the certification and verification to ensure the safety of the passengers. Yeah. All right. Great. Great. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so I have, you know, some of you are experienced in this industry, specifically in this uh, ships and then the uh, aerospace industry. Now I have. Two questions. Maybe you can actually attempt to answer both at the same time. One is that, um, what? How do you embrace this innovative technology in this digital transformation? That's one. What's your experiences, right, in uh, embracing this innovative technology? Second is that, while doing so, what are the challenges that you face in adopting this uh, these technologies? Uh, maybe Dr. Hana, uh, Hanafi is already here, so maybe you can continue. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, can I, Farah? Can you let me share uh, my slides, please? All right. Um, okay. So everyone can see my slides, huh? Yes. All right. Cool. So um, before, before before I start, uh, maybe just like a very uh, small introduction of my organization. Where do I come from? So basically, I'm from Aerospace Malaysia Innovation Center. So AMI is a private public partnership. We are like a research and uh, research uh, consortium, whereby our lead members are Airbus, Rolls Royce, uh, CTRM, Mine, and also Mara. So our aim is, is actually to um, sus- to as an initiative to sustain the survivability and competitiveness of Malaysian aerospace industry. Okay. And our uh, three main uh, research pillars are Factor of the Future, which uh, consists of aerospace manufacturing activities, um, like composite carbon fibers. And then we have Training of the Future, uh, which deals with um, VR, AR, and AI automation. And last but not least is the sustainable aviation. Right. If you have any question, queries, then uh, we can uh, contact us later. Right. So. For the, um, how do we actually um, um, embrace the innovative technologies and digital transformation? So basically, um, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the journey has um, already started. Um, it is not um, very fast moving, but it is uh, there. As we can see, uh, the industry 4.0 can be classified or can be categorized into eight to nine uh, categories. But um, for the interest of time, to make it succinct, I will only um, share about five categories, which is related to um, aero, aero, aero manufacturing of the uh, industry, uh, aerospace industry, which is additive manufacturing, um, and then simulation, augmented reality, industrial internet of things, IOT, and also autonomous robot. Right, so um, let us move to the additive manufacturing. So basically, uh, um, additive manufacturing in aerospace manufacturing industry can be subdivided into four uh, technologies. The first one is automated fiber placement, then automated tape layup, uh, fiber patch placement, and also composite 3D printing. So basically, um, for automated placement, in conventional aircraft component manufacturing, uh, the carbon plies are laid up manually, one by one, one after another, onto a mold okay, to make a part. And then um, normally the problems associated with manual layup are delamination, which is um, the subsequent um, plies are not um, laminated uh, uh, perfectly. And there are porosity bubbles in between the plies, wrong orientation of the carbon plies, high material wastage, and also health and safety hazard for the personnel, such as the back pain. And the AFB, automated fiber placement technology, is meant to replace the current manual layout process uh, reduce the layout uh, defects, minimize the material wastage, also increase production and precision of the panel produced. The automated tape layout, on the other hand, um, is quite similar to the AFP, but the difference is 
for the automated tape layout, it use wider unidirectional tapes, which covers for mainly larger and flatter uh, composite panel like wing skin. Okay, and fiber patch placement is actually um, small patches of um, spread to carbon fiber used to create components. Okay, these patches are uh, placed uh, in the direction that follows the path with the highest stress. And um, the paths are determined through simulation from which the uh, placement methodology is created. And 3D printing, uh, we know this technology already. This is not a novel technology. However, development into using standard 3D printers to create composite parts is actually being undertaken. And both discontinuous and continuous fibers are then embedded into the 3D printers to print the composite parts. Right. Um, so next, uh, the other uh, component of IR 4.0 being implemented uh, in the aerospace industry are simulation tool. So we know already the simulation tools being used like FEA and also CFD for structural design and aerodynamics. But now uh, we are climbing uh, one step further uh, whereby we use this technology to simulate the manufacturing processes which leads to digital training. So what is digital twinning? So basically digital twinning is a concept of a digital replica of the part of the process of the line or any other physical entity link to the actual object okay, to create cyber physical system. What happened in the physical world in the shop floor is instantaneously being reflected in the digital system. So the person in charge will know if there is any issues arise. Okay, immediately. And the benefits of the system actually de depend on the level of interaction okay, between the reality and also the simulation. Whether we want to use the uh, simulation to supervise what's happening in the shop floor or we want to interact. For example, if there is a defect ha happens, so alarm will be triggered. And also we want to predict, for example, if we use this material, what would be the life cycle of uh, the production, what would be the life cycle of the equipment. So it helps us with the maintenance and so on. Right? So that is the simulation tool. And um, um, augmented reality is another um, category. So basically, due to the complexity of the composite manufacturing, we foresee the manual process is likely to remain the case for um, most of the components except for the higher production rate parts. Okay, so to digitalize um, the human part of composite manufacturing is not easy, uh, but we don't want this um, aero manufacturing to be left behind as a cottage industry. So, for example, in the application of AR, um, AR um, Airbus technicians are, are using uh, these uh, smart glasses to enable millimeter precise positioning during cabin installation marking process. So, basically, this HMT, this head mounted technology, it has a camera to scan the barcodes so the user can see the specific cabin plan uh, and information based on the requirement. What is the specification? What is the tolerance? Okay, in, order, in addition to viewing the marking zone, right? So that is the application of augmented reality. And the next thing is the industrial internet of things. Okay, so basically we have been talking about this um, today and it actually represents the connectivity. So the key point here is the connectivity between equipment and also database in organization. Okay, whether that be on the shop floor or engineering office. So in order to be able to both, to both collect and feed the data back, the equipment must be connected to the network through sensors. So these are the these are the main uh, gist of the Internet of Things. And uh, for example, um, intelligent curing. Okay? One of the process in uh, aircraft manufacturing is curing, whereby the, the carbon fiber uh, is placed into a big chamber, which, uh, which is then cured by using heat and pressure. So for the uh, intelligent curing, okay, uh, there's one company who actually embed ultrasonic sensors in the curing tools. And it has been shown that it is possible to actually monitor the curing progress of the laminate, and thereby they can see exactly when the carbon uh, laminates are cured, and then reducing the overall curing process time. Okay. And next thing is autonomous robot. We're also talking about this. So basically for autonomous, uh, autonomous robot, if you look at the traditional robots, okay, generally, it requires monitoring and inspection since there are no feedback loops to 
confirm um, the automated operation has uh, been performed satisfactorily, achieved the uh, specification. And for example, we can see here the accurate drilling. Um, so it is a system developed by a company in Europe. They have incorporated a sensor in the system to allow feedback. Okay. For example, during the drilling, if there is an error or uh, issues occurs, the robot can correct itself. Okay. It's a feedback system. And on the other um, example is the predictive maintenance. Okay. For predictive maintenance, traditionally, uh, we plan the maintenance. Okay. But for this one, the plan maintenance may not be required at the interval suggested by monitoring the condition and only heavy maintenance when required will also reduce the overall maintenance cost. And this uh, as a whole will actually bring up a concept of what we call as disruptive business. So basically for disruptive business, I give you an example. Um, it is related to on-demand economy. Uh, that means be able to fulfill the uh, requirement in a very short amount of time. For example, for a bidding process in um, aerospace manufacturing industry, let's say a customer want uh, to request for bidding. So what they will do, they will uh, upload the models uh, of components or parts or aircraft and requirements to a portal. And this company, the, the aero manufacturing company with the machine learning algorithm, okay, using all the data gained from the sensorized equipment, Okay, uh, within the factory and also all the combined with all the criteria production process, uh, also the data in inventory levels and the lead time from suppliers. So all these are connected together as uh, together with the production availability, their main resources, so they can come up with a quote within a short period of, of time. And the quote is very, very accurate because they are using the actual real data that is available in their industry. Right, so um, that is my take on the um, on how aerospace industry embraced the innovative technologies um, and transformation. But again, if you talk about the challenges, basically for aero manufacturing industry, most of the production activities are still heavily dependent on human human skill. Right, seventy to eighty five percent. It is a unique sector, and to change from manual to digital uh, automation, so it requires um, extensive studies on how a robot or machine automation can actually mimic human gestures, skills, and therefore it requires a lot of data collection and artificial intelligence integrated in the system. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rafi. Now, that is uh, from Aero's uh, Space uh, Industry. So now let's, let's say from maybe uh, Mr. Nasri about your, 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 um, you know, perspective on this uh, from the ship industry. One is this experience of what are the technology can be embraced. Second is that uh, what are the challenges in adopting this uh, digital transformation? Nazri, are you with that? Nazri? Sorry, I lost uh, my phone was ringing when uh, when. <laughs> Um, are, you, are you there, Nazri? You, you want to share about your the technologies that can be, I mean, has been embraced in the ship industries and what are the challenges uh, that you face or the industry face in adopting these uh, technologies? Um, so just two slides on, on challenges in the industry. Appreciate that. Yeah, you have to share the slides. Uh... Anyway, there are several uh, challenges. Mm. Uh, mm. Yes, please. I have two slides on uh, on uh, challenges in the uh, the industry. Can you share the slides, uh, Nazri? Uh... I um, I'm not connected to my slides. Uh, uh, so oh, okay. Uh, um, the host, yeah. Okay, let me just uh, start off by saying that uh, there yeah, are sure. some of them are, are, are I, I would divide them into hardware and software. The hardware part obviously entails uh, infrastructure and uh, systems, uh, connections, connectivity, and so on. 
uh, also obviously investment. But uh, the other soft side of it would be human capital development, enabling policies, changing the mindset, the uh, organizational culture to adopt Industry 4.0. In other words, uh, you know, uh, organizations within the marine industry uh, have got to unlearn what they know all this while about operating within a brick and mortar environment and, uh, and make that quantum leap uh, towards operating in a digital uh, economy. Because uh, uh, the marine industry, which uh, entails uh, shipping facilitates close to 95% of global trade, and uh, ships, of course, call at ports, and ships are built at shipyards, and uh, they are all, both three are supported by a million and one uh, ancillary services and equipment manufacturing and so many other uh, different types of players. Uh, can, can I uh, bring you guys to the uh, last, second last slide, please? Not that. All right, the last slide. Um, all right, do you mind? Okay, here's just a bunch of uh, things which I managed to cram into a, a one uh, slide. Uh, enabling ecosystem, and I mentioned about investment, we have uh, spoken a bit about human capital, education, training and learning, upskilling, reskilling, uh, that's also uh, yeah, very important. So in other words, uh, the TVET part of it, uh, maritime uh, uh, education and training, uh, and colleges have got to up the ante and uh, reflect their, their curriculum to enable uh, uh, the uh, to, to nurture the uh, more uh, digital ready uh, human capital in the uh, in the marine industry and also I mentioned about enhancing awareness is where the rules and associations such as army um, uh, Massa Malaysian Owners Association Malaysian OSV Owners Association uh, even Malaysian Oil and Gas Service Council Moxie uh, are very crucial in terms of uh, educating the uh, uh, players to, to understand a bit more uh, about the uh, industry 4.0 and the application uh, uh, within within that. And uh, last and certainly but not least is the uh, changing of mindset, organizational culture, behavior, and also perspective about, about how the world operates and how um, uh, the marine industry stands within the uh, grand scheme of things as uh, one of the crucial facilitators of a global economy, not only in terms of facilitating uh, uh, seaborne transport, uh, global trade, but also to facilitate a whole bunch of uh, very important activities to the global economy, such as uh, exploration, production of uh, oil and gas, uh, marine tourism, uh, port uh, 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 services, and uh, so many others. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Nazri and uh, Dr. Hanapi earlier. And now, no, knowing that uh, there are so many challenges in, uh, you know, adopting in uh, transforming uh, the current businesses, right? Uh, maybe, Harshit, so what do you think that required uh, to strengthen this industry further? Yeah, I think that's a, a good question. And it's certainly the answer here is linked to what uh, Mr. Nasri just mentioned that there's, there's so many challenges in embracing technology like cultural mindset, leadership issues, uh, making sure the end user is interested in these things. So all of them have to be fixed to essentially <laughs> really get you know, the adoption going. But in our research from a technology view, what we have seen is that the first thing you have to fix is the data philosophy of the company. Um, you have to make sure that data management in your company is robust, uh, the acquisition, collection, Cleaning of data is so well that if you do bring in someone to come in and create some software, there's good data already sitting there to do analysis on it. So that's one aspect of it. You know, you need to make sure that. And over the cultural side, the leadership, right from the C level, have to now start really, you know, putting that mindset into the company. And generally, how you can really create a difference is by having lots of incentives for middle management people. So that's where the embracing stops. The C level is interested in digital, but then you have middle management, all that that we you start losing it. So you have to create incentives for them. So to make sure that they actually enable their people to work on digital and whatnot. So yeah, it's so definitely a hard question, but I think have been part of that. Yeah, I think I think uh, the good thing is that we know that there are so many challenges. Uh, I think from there onwards we can actually you know, come up uh, some kind of uh, solutions to strengthen uh, some kind of, you know, process to strengthen uh, or to, to, to resolve the issues that we face in adopting these challenges. And now, 
Now, having said that, maybe from um, because we have uh, Mr. Sunko from the you know industry. Uh, of course, we have two them here. Uh, what 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 is what is your company doing in terms of strengthening this industry? Is it the same? I mean, in adopting uh, the yes, yes. Um, well, for us, we have been doing it over the past twenty odd years. Uh, we do it slowly, um, and I think yeah, it's, it's we have to approach it cautiously because uh, it's we have to stay alive at the same time. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, um, and, and having said that, I think having uh, having commitment from leadership is important. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for our yard here, our management top management has has decided to put emphasis on this. So we actually have a full time uh, software engineers, um, and and I I do it as as part. Of, I'm part of the team, uh, writing this software myself. Oh, great, great, great to hear that. Now, uh, for the participants, if you have any questions, please, please uh, write it down in the chat and we will try to attend as many questions as possible after this. Uh, so moving on, right? Um, see, industries need to move on in terms of, you know, competitiveness in the capabilities and quality. In fact, most, most of the uh, panelists have stated uh, what is required, right, in terms of the uh, mindset change instead of uh, reskilling. So these are all required, right? Now, uh, I'd like to ask this question to maybe Harshit. Uh, so what is Lux's long-term outlook for logistics and transportation companies uh, because of digital transformation? Is it simply going to benefit them or would it create more problems in the future? Yeah, I think that's a uh, good question. And the benefits are often discussed quite extensively like everyone knows it's it's useful for your organization to go through it but it's also creating threats uh, for example in the us we have seen that a lot of the traditional 3pl companies 4pl or even like companies who offer transport services in logistics they are actually uh, seeing a bit of a loss in their stakeholdership in the industry because of digital uh, technology is coming through so for example the main entrance these days in digital right now are the software companies. So someone like Microsoft uh, right now is offering lots more digital services to logistics as compared to a traditional 3PL company. So we do see that the tech giants will slowly just cannibalize a lot of market share, so which will be a threat for anyone operating in logistics in general. And likewise, you're also seeing a lot of the e-commerce companies gradually just taking more ownership, like Alibaba, for example, in China, they've already bought tons of companies in, in logistics because they just want to make sure that they control the industry and someone like an Amazon or something, if they do want to come into China, they really can't, if most uh, are working with them. So, so yeah, I mean, that's where we see. The more digital you adopt, the more you're opening yourself to, to tech companies and the more the threats are going to come through. So it's not just benefits, it's going to create problems as well. Okay, great. Great. Uh, I think uh, the last question for me, uh, before we take a question from the audience, um, uh, for each panel uh, members here, if you were to pick two technologies, right, uh, that are vital for the your industry, uh, transportation and logistics, uh, what would they be? Right? Two, only two. Yeah, maybe you can start with um, uh, Sunko. Currently, uh, I can't think of anything at the moment. But I think maybe that, IoT. Okay. Maybe IoT, Internet of Things, or uh, you know, artificial intelligence or digital twins. Uh, what do you think? I think for for us, we have been quite. I mean, the, uh, the shipbuilding industry has been uh, has been set back for a long while. So with any any funds we have right now is put back to building up our cap, uh, our infrastructure uh, and heavy machinery. So I think for the time being, we are trying to build capacity in, in, in terms of, uh, of manufacturing rather than this kind of uh, ICT in, in investment. But having said right. that, there are many areas that we are also looking into uh, mm -hmm. because 
it both some sometimes this thing i mean it, it has to go hand in hand whatever we invest uh, in machinery side i mean we do hope that we, we do have connectivity to our management system so that is something that we are looking at okay no robotics eh? yes we are looking into <laughs> as well ah, okay good good <laughs> okay so let's hear from the others uh dr hanafi okay um for me uh, i think I look at two perspectives. The first one is the commercial aviation, which is the passenger centric. Um, for in terms of the passenger centric, the most uh, important technology is uh, big data. So basically, uh, nowadays um, the company or the entity who has the most data takes the lead and control because they can do a lot of things with the data, especially the passengers' data, the behavior. Um, even during the hard time like COVID-19, having the data is actually very vital to ensure the company is resilient and they can identify what is the necessary steps need to be taken to survive and also to recover uh, back to the uh, business to the normal. And for the aero manufacturing industry, I think the Internet of Things, the IIoT has become uh, more and more important uh, because it connects the missing dots between the digital and also the physical reality. So it closes the gap uh, that causes previously losses, wastages, inefficiency and low productivity <coughs> in manufacturing industries. I think that's one. Right. Okay, thank you. How about you, Nazri? Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So uh, if I were to pick two things, okay, first I would say uh, uh, additive uh, manufacturing, not addictive, additive, uh, three different things. Uh, um, because it's already uh, used to a certain extent by ship owners who carry some simple form of, uh, of a 3D printer to print nuts, bolts, certain spare parts, which are not really critical to, to the operation of a ship. I mean, obviously you're going to be 3D printing a, a, a broken propeller on board of a ship, right? But you can, uh, to a certain degree, uh, certain parts which can be used uh, as, uh, uh, if I may use an 80s term, you can MacGyver your way out of certain situations mm -hmm. with a 3D printer, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and until you get to a port uh, where you can actually get the actual spare parts and so on. But what, what is uh, uh, great about uh, 3D printing is that it allows you to, uh, to uh, use uh, uh, additive manufacturing capabilities uh, to, to get by uh, until the not only until the parts come, but also sometimes it's not feasible to to produce a huge amount of anything when you only want to use uh, a, a few uh, unit of items. So this is where three D printing is is, uh, is is really very helpful. And three D printing technology has gotten to a point where it, it can really uh, I mean some of the some of the things that can be produced with uh, additive uh, manufacturing three D printing is really quite impressive. I mean. Uh, I've uh, I've seen uh, some printers which are not. I mean, they don't really cause an arm and a leg, and uh, they can really uh, uh, be very very helpful for for ship owners, for example, or even shipyards who uh, for for lacking economies of scale to purchase or procure huge amounts of of any types of uh, of equipment. They can just uh, produce uh, one or two items, and, uh, which is gaining traction is blockchain. Uh, in line with uh, e-commerce, uh, increase in uh, in uh, utilization of uh, internet things, uh, big data analytics for cargo shipment tracking and monitoring and so on. So with blockchain technology, the uh, uh, amount of data that you uh, uh, put into a system is huge, and also you can uh, do a lot of uh, things. You can manipulate the data, and uh, you can really do one things with it. You can do you know can generate uh, reports. You can also do a lot of, uh, of forecasting and so on and data really is uh, the uh, the currency i guess and uh, as mentioned by uh, uh uh previous speakers before data is is all uh you know the, the new the new lot of the rings and, uh, you know without data you just another idiot with an opinion as i say right <laughs> okay <laughs> okay and uh yeah the last uh panelist maybe harshit uh Maybe you can share what are the two technologies that you pick. I think for for me, any industrial IoT solution is uh, like the really good, good quick win right now. So 
So like predictive maintenance or cold chain monitoring. Mm. So sort of solutions in this business will generate like value like right now. So I think that's definitely where to start. And I think let's just mention blockchain as well. That's becoming really popular for visibility purposes. But my big will be yeah, any applications of industrial IoT. That's All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the panel members today. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear your insights uh, uh, and your sharing uh, your experiences and so on. Um, now I will open the questions uh, for the audience. Um, if you have any questions, please, please uh, write it down, type it down in the chat. Or you can also share in the YouTube as well. I think we have a YouTube live. Um, now there's a question from uh from youtube okay the uh, first question is are there any possible quick wins that can be applied or used within this one to two years or by 2022 yes are there any possible quick wins that can be applied i assume it's technology or services uh, and all those things um anyone uh, any can i volunteer uh, uh ralph yeah please as I say, uh, famous last words uh, for fools who haven't spoken enough. So let me be that fool by offering to once again make a reference to the uh, industry, the industry 4.0 master plan, which has been uh, uh, developed by our friends at Champion uh, Lead. And they, again, I, I want to uh, uh, mention that there are a lot of very good things uh, which have been laid out there. And of course, uh, some of them have been highlighted by myself and other uh, esteemed speakers. Blockchain technology, big data analytics, uh, you know, the use of drones is now, uh, you know, being uh, extended way beyond uh, uh, even uh, military, but also commercial, or also even in, in uh, search and rescue and so on. So uh, the potential is just tremendous. Uh, even uh, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, oh my God. I mean, if you list of all the uh, enabling technologies of Industry 4.0, each and every one of them uh, promises a huge uh, thing. So it's really rather difficult to, to uh, pick a winner from this uh, parade of Miss Universe. But if you, if, if you must uh, uh, put a gun on someone's head and, and ask him, okay, what are the things which are most obvious in the next one or two years? We can just see uh, within uh, during the time of MCO the explosion of our online uh, 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 e-commerce, uh, anything online, you know, uh, grab food delivery, uh, you know, uh, purchase of uh, items and even procurement of services online. Um, even now, we're having uh, you know a Teams meeting. So these are the kind of things which are being enabled by Industry 4.0, and I think the new norms emanating from uh, from the pandemic such as uh, social distancing and so on will be those which are uh, i think in in uh, in the most uh, the most priority like within the next uh, one or two years 2022 is only a, a one or two years uh, down the road so i think whatever's happening now will probably take a greater traction and and assume a higher degree of importance if uh, no vaccine is found for covid and we continue to live within this uh, new norm I think on top of that, you correctly pointed out, in fact, drone, what has been used right now, right, can be used for maritime and also for aerospace industries as well. For example, for maintenance purposes, you know, you can, you know, you can fly the drone to check, you know, certain parts of the, you know, big, huge ships instead of letting people move and go. But at the same time, you are capturing the images and then you are doing analysis of the images and so on. So these are some of the quick win, I feel. Um, is there any other panel members here who want to share? Uh, if not, we go for the next question. Okay, so there's um, uh, another question uh, from the audience. Is there huge differences in challenges for the different modes of transportation in logistics? Is there huge differences in challenges for the different modes of transportation in logistics? Um, anyone want to answer this? Maybe, um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm about to <laughs> call you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think uh, how we see is definitely there's, there's a difference. The uh, shipping industry, for that matter, has the worst mm. uh, in among all of them because communication telecoms is very difficult for them. So, most marine industry still operates with 1G, 
from what I know, and that kind of a telecommunication setup will not help you with any sort of real-time insights or the data like sharing or management is really difficult. So adding automation there, any remote connectivity there is very difficult. So that's going to be the last place where you will see lots of innovation coming and the road transport as well, like uh, even though like it has good connectivity, but we have seen situations where uh, you know, you have a sensor being used to track maybe the temperature of a perishable food item or something. But even those kind of things uh, consistently don't record the information. Uh, sometimes you don't have telecom, you know, networks available around. So I would say among all of them, worse would be for the shipping industry, aviation, or like has mixed and then, then road transport. So the trucking side is where most of the developments will happen and then maybe in the future towards shipping as well. Really offer the American perspective on that, if I may, just about 30 seconds. Yeah. No. Uh, we can't hear you. Perspective, real quick, 30 seconds. Yes, please, please. Okay, uh, uh, obviously, uh, shipping will always be uh, relevant until probably uh, at least within our lifetime, uh, given its uh, economies of scale, and also given the fact that the use of uh, sea is free, and uh, also the fact that. Uh, um, seaborne transport has become so embedded in the uh, global uh, supply chain. Uh, but at the same time, much is needed in terms of uh, uh, preparing uh, shipping uh, to get to the, uh, to, the, to the next stage of uh, digital uh, economy. I mean, uh, as, uh, as, as mentioned earlier and as agreed by many people in this, this uh, room that, uh, you know, shipping is notoriously slow to adopt to any new things uh, unless it is being forced down their throats by uh, authorities such as the International Maritime uh, Organization or by port state controls by governments uh, and, and, and even uh, by, by other authorities uh, to a certain degree. But at the same time, shipping must take the initiative. Let's take, for example, uh, uh, admission. Shipping only contributes to only about 2.5% from like, the total global emission from transport. This is way, way much lower compared to a land transport, compared to aviation. But if nothing is done to curb this emission, this uh, level of uh, emission will increase by three, four pull much faster than, uh, than the other transport uh, uh, area. So, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the authorities have done a lot to, uh, to reduce emissions from shipping. For example, IMO, uh, the authority of uh, in, in, uh, International Convention on, on Use of the Sea, has introduced uh, on all kinds of uh, protocols, uh, international conventions, the latest being uh, 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 sulfur ruling, uh, which kicks which uh, kick off in the first January 2020. But at the same time, a lot more needs to be done uh, to help uh, ship owners, uh, you know, reduce their carbon footprint and also to, uh, to ensure the longevity of, of ships. Even uh, just imagine, uh, you know, with the uh, amazing technology that we have today, something like uh, what happened to the Japanese uh, ship could happen uh, in Mauritius. Of course, you can also blame, uh, you know, human error for that. But uh, no doubt if, uh, you know, ships can be more of, uh, future proof uh, to be more safe and to be more secure and so on. And this is where industry 4.0 comes in with all these enabling technologies uh, and all the uh, solutions that it offers to help uh, shipping to become safer, more environmental friendly and also more secure. Thanks. Um, Dr. Gopi, can I add something? Um, okay. Um, okay, can I add something? Yes, yes, please, please. Um, all right, okay, so um, the differences in challenges, especially for the um, aerospace industry, we can see, especially for the uh, post-pandemic uh, event, that um, people are afraid to fly out. And because of that, um, there is a drastic uh, reduction in demand in terms of the new aircraft and production has been uh, tremendously low. Uh, new aircraft delivery has been deferred very far and uh, up to a point, uh, there are no um, even uh, orders for new, for new aircrafts. So, um, and 
uh, apart from that, the maintenance also has been very uh, minimized because um, lower number of um, aircraft flying. And because of that, we know that um, it also affects in terms of the um, job cuts. Um, a lot of pilots and stewarders, cabin crews has uh, lost their jobs. And um, I think um, we hope that this, um, this uh, effect will not uh, be prolonged. And I think recently people start to fly back. And hopefully within this one or two years, we can actually gain back um, the recovery for this uh, industry. So either it is a logistic cargo or, or, or the passenger um, air, um, in the, uh, aviation industry. So we really hope that by implementing this technology, especially in terms of um, spreading the news on how the aviation uh, industry or airliners um, take precautious steps in order to ensure that their uh, flights are safe. Um, all the safety uh, steps taken, so they need to um, spread this news to various um, uh, channels and various ways to reach uh, the potential customers in order to gain back their uh, trust and their uh, confidence to fly again. And hopefully, it will um, help with the economic recovery. All right, great, great, Anafi. Uh, Anafi. Uh, in fact, I wanted to uh, mention about the incident that happened in Mauritius, right? The, where the ship, you know, there, there, there's a pro and con, right? So now, assuming that we have the technology that can detect, what as we mentioned earlier, right? It can actually, you know, save a lot many things. Now, currently, because of these issues that we are facing, it disrupts the entire ecosystem. And I was told that it would take five, ten years to basically clean up and bring back the entire ecosystem in that particular area. Um, so this is something food for thought, I think, um, something that uh, everyone has to think uh, what technology that can be adopted to solve these kind of issues. I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, thank you for your great insights, for your great sharings. Um, uh, Harshit uh, from Lux, Dr. Hanafi from Aerospace Malaysia, uh, Mr. Nazri, adjunct professor in the Malaysia Trangano, and Mr. Chu from uh, Oh, I forgot the name. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chu from Amin. Okay, sleep with in Amrhat. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, basically, what we have listened to is from basically on the perspective. What are the challenges that we have in adopting in transforming each and every industry uh, in digital transformation? Right. There are so many technologies been shared. Um, IIT, robotics, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, many things. And one of the most important things that I, I feel is that the mindset, right? The leadership should adopt digital, right? Uh, if not, what will happen is that they may lose out with the other competitors in the same industry. Uh, they need to quickly adopt, quickly transform the existing businesses and be competitive uh, for the next uh, few years down the road, I assume. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Thank you for all the listeners. Um, until the next round, I guess, um, I'll pass it on to Farah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gopi, Dr. Hanafi, Mr. Chiu, and Inchit Nazri, and also Harshit for the very enlightening and interesting discourse. And uh, I hope from this session we are very clear about what are the opportunities and also concerns being brought forth by all these interesting technologies of the post industrial revolution, if we can say that. And uh, of course, there are concerns and also areas that we have to look at in terms of technology, in terms of uh, human capacity building, and also in terms of investment. So um, this is not the end, and uh, we have more webinar series that we have and I, I would like to invite you to also join us for our next webinar session which is going to be uh, on the 21st of august 2020 uh, on digital transformation also but in transport and logistic at 10 a.m and 11 30 p.m involving i mean a.m involving automotive rail and logistics because today we covered uh, very much on aerospace and um, maritime or shipbuilding ship repair so for friday we'll be uh, focusing on automotive rail and logistic industries at large 
So we hope you can follow uh, my Malaysia's social media platforms such as Twitter, IG, Facebook, and a website for further information. You can also contact us, the Secretariat, to subscribe to our Mike's webinar series, and we can invite you for our next, I mean, our coming seminar. So have a nice evening ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.